Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jungle, presented by Deserto. It's your boy Degon here with Dom and Monty, and we had one hell of a weekend of League of Legends. Lots of matches, and uh, if you're wondering why I'm covered in green screen this time and using this ball, I'm still in Las Vegas. My flight got canceled and then postponed because rain is happening in LA and apparently it never rains in LA. So we have to cancel all the flights ever going to LA. So uh, any of the audio things, anything like that, just wanted to cover that off of the top. Uh, so uh, if you guys, you, yeah, you. what's up? Do you always fly on planes dressed like the rock from the nineties? <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I think if you look good, you, you, you fly good, right? You want to you want to dress for the the future that you want. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind being the rock that you want. Uh, Are you going to time travel? Yeah, we we could we could time travel and, and go back in time and wish that we never asked players for money or whatever. It's fine. You know when I when I travel on planes, I just dress entirely head to toe in black, so no one will ever talk to me. <laughs> it's true. Nice. It's very effective. Uh. Funnily enough, no. I just ran out of clothes. This was uh, I was here for a bachelor bachelorette party, and so I had to go into the backup like dress up night clothes. So, I think uh, uh, that's, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Dom doesn't <laughs> gas me up, but that's okay. Yeah, I'm still like trying it. to get over the microphone myself. So. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, man. Right, let us know in the comments uh, what you think about the microphone after, of course, you subscribe because we called out Astralis last time on how many subs they have. Uh, what is it, eleven seven? And we're at almost seven thousand subscribers. So make sure you uh, subscribe some so I can level up my uh, my remote setup. And I will have good microphone usage while we're on the road because we got to be on the road because that's the work that we do. Uh, be on the road, host things and whatnot. Uh, lots of league, lots of different leagues. First time that we're talking about LEC and what feels like forever. LCS finally, finally, TSM off the rift drama, not the center point of drama here. TSM did have parts to play in the LCS, so let's dive in there. Going into the final week, we had two teams that were eliminated with TSM and Immortals. We had Dignitas, who had the hardest strength of schedule, still left. We had uh, TL and Cloud9 still battling out who was going to be number one. And uh, day one really opened some doors and closed a couple doors here, Dom, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was interesting in LCS. I'm kind of disappointed because that's the last time we get to see TSM. So now we're going to have to talk about <laughs> teams that are not as exciting. I mean, I think that LCS was a lot better when we all had a common enemy here um, and they're <laughs> unfortunately gone. I mean, maybe CLG will pick up some hate. I saw some people really, really upset on the fact that they use their academy lineup because this happens every final uh, day of the LCS season. Um, when a team just uses their academy lineup, people just go up in arms because apparently the last match is the one that matters for competitive integrity um, the entire time. Yeah, not, not the other 17 games that a team could have won at no. any other point in the season. No, you should look. It's up to CLG to do what's in Dignitas's best interest on the final day. That's what I think. <laughs> I'm just going to be the good guy, you know? Good cop, bad cop. Monty's always negative. I'll just take the side of the community. <laughs> I, I do think it's ridiculous. Like, you're, you know, you, you have an opportunity to give players stage time if you're a bad team. And if you're a good team, you have an opportunity potentially to rest your starters and not show things bet before playoffs. How It's how it works in traditional sports. You earn that right. Stop fucking crying about it. I am super sick of doing it. Your team could have won any of the other games that they lost. And they're in this situation for a reason. And if CLG wants to fuck around and run their full Academy roster to give them stage time and to evaluate potential changes for the next split, that is their prerogative. So shut the fuck up. Oh, I mean, also, Forever. it's like, I don't feel that bad about an eight and 10 team not being in playoffs. Like, <laughs> yeah, like you, you <laughs> lost more games than you won. Like, why? Like, why do you get to, to get like, I, I don't really want to see more Dignitas personally. <laughs> like, I, I think we saw enough of them. I think they overperformed expectations. Seventh place is nice uh, for them, all things considered. And, you know, like, I, I, I don't see why people are so upset with CLG uh, running bad players. I mean, TSM did it all split and no one cared. So. Uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah frankly like Dignitas is super lucky that Immortals and TSM were much worse than expected to even get the placing that they did 
Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's always that. And then the other the other part uh, of, of the situation is that, like, when you look overall at, you know, LCS, this split and, and the the teams that played. You see, like, all these teams underperforming and then you see, like, the CLG team getting crucified for using their lineup when you could make an argument that their academy lineup might even be better than their real lineup. Like their academy yeah, their real lineup, lineup looks... is an academy lineup, guys. Yeah, Literally. So, the, so they're getting <laughs> shit on for using like their first place academy team in the final game when they had like an eighth place team. Where I think that like if CLG really wanted really wanted to win the split, like I would have liked to see Dokla come in uh, over Jenkins. I would have liked to see Rose Thorn um, come in over Contracts when Contracts was struggling so hard when it, when Jenkins was bottom too. So like when I look at L LCS overall as a whole, and I'm like, what could be like really egregious use of an academy team? I don't really think that this is the one where I'm like. I'm fucking pissed, bro. Using the first place academy team <laughs> in LCS. Like, dude, sure. People will always go to, well, CLG, the real roster actually ended up uh, winning um, versus EG in the first game that they played. So maybe there's like some matchup thing there, but EG should be expected to beat CLG either way. And I think that this academy lineup, like just because the game went bad, doesn't mean that they're actually that shit. They were playing a volatile draft with the vein top. Didn't end up working out. Okay. Like, also, That's... I didn't see a lot of complaints with Immortals running Chad and then playing Arrow on his signature Draven pick <laughs> in their last game when if they win that game, then Golden Guardians it doesn't make playoffs, potentially. Yep. Yeah, uh, I think it was the wholesale changes. I think it was because CLG did quote unquote everything right PR wise, putting it out, letting people know, explaining why people are upset. But it, because it wasn't wholesale changes there for Immortals, uh, they're they're still taking the flack there, and uh, it, it does beg the question: like, how catastrophic would it have been for Evil Geniuses if they lost that game, then lose a tiebreaker to Dignitas, and they're out all of a sudden? Like, this is a squad that uh, well, I think they definitely wouldn't have deserved to be in playoffs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think it it. it even though they finish at fourth right now in the regular season, they do get that upper bracket uh, by due to the tiebreakers uh, that happened. Uh, this team is, uh, is it off of where their expectations were? Because I felt like they were pretty high, especially after Lockett. I mean, I, I think that like realistically fourth is fine. Like, for, like the way that they got fourth was bad. But if you wanted to just look at placements, I could have 100% seen them being as good as I expected and still getting fourth. Like if, if hundred thieves showed up as the former champions and like one of the teams that most people considered to be really strong, this entire split because of the continuity of the lineup. And then you have like C9 who impressed, they actually looked really good for most of the split. And then TL who everyone had at the absolute top. I think that fourth is completely reasonable for evil geniuses. It's just the, the manner in which they got fourth, like dropping a bunch of games to teams that you believe that they could beat. And just like their, their overall gameplay just didn't look convincing really throughout most of the split. Um, I think that that's like where, you know, it, it's not like all fourth places are created equal. And this fourth place was definitely a, a bad fourth place for EG. <laughs> yeah. If anything, a nine and nine record in fourth place is extremely disappointing. I would I would contest like being 50 yeah. percent and being in the top four. You, there's a pretty big gulf there. But I don't think realistically like people got high on the fucking hope Very high. during during lock in. But you have to contextualize it and say, no one had their roster. Nobody had their roster. Core JJ wasn't playing. Bjergsen was playing his first competitive games, professional games for the last year. Cloud9 didn't have players. Uh, 100, 100 Thieves was shitty for whatever reason, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I, I, I think that they benefited pretty greatly from exterior results or, you know, exterior factors. And that once teams got back into their condition and got all their players... Uh, they were not expected to do this, right? Yeah. Fourth place was probably where you would have ranked them. And you would have said they would have been over 50%. I would have said that at the start yeah. of the season. I mean, I think that it would have been fair to to rank them higher based off the fact that Cloud9 was such a big question mark. Like I know personally, sure. I didn't know, like I knew nothing about Winsome. Um, never seen him play before. I, I found out yesterday that he played like on the Kespa Twitch channel, uh, in like the equivalent of amateur it's called academy but the way that like korea works it's like korean challenger and then academy so it's like essentially third tier um uh in in korea like i'd never seen him play before i'd seen berserker play one series in my entire life and it's like it's very hard to like know if you're not following the league 
entirely like the strength of the league and like how much it actually means to be one of the best 80 carries in Korean challenger. Like, is that going to be enough to suddenly be one of the best 80 carries in, in LCS? Because we've seen players that have been some of the quote best players in the world, um, like piglet, uh, come to NA and not succeed. So like, w like it's, it's very rare that you import three players from Korea well, I mean, obviously, most of the time you can't import three players in, in Korea. So that's a that's a different <laughs> circumstance. But it's very rare that you you import this amount of of uh, new players with language barriers, et cetera, and you actually have the team be successful. So, like, I personally thought that EG, when you look at like all their players, I mean, Impact is always good in NA, right? Vulcan is is always one of the best supports in NA. Danny looked really good, and and everyone is going to think that inspired like MVP caliber is is going to be solid. So I just thought that there was a higher chance that this lineup gels, um, which it hasn't compared to like the cloud nine lineup, which I knew very little about um, coming in. So, I mean, with cloud nine actually doing better than expectations, that's what makes the fourth place, like look completely reasonable. Yeah. Uh, appreciate the context there too, on the different imports. We all, I think a lot of the time we treat all imports, import rules, import, slot takers the same it's just it's just not it's just not there's a caliber that you want to hit but the way that the roster i think makes is uh very different so that gives us our uh top six teams going to playoffs as we say goodbye to dignitas who tried to make a good run there at the end as they were able to be defeat uh 100 thieves and fly quest were on the flip end where they lose their game, the matchup, the head-to-head -head matchup game with Evil Geniuses on Friday. They drop the game to Immortals, uh, but then do it the hard way by beating Cloud9 uh, in their final match of the weekend here, Monty. And it, 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 was, uh, it was a game of League of Legends. Kumo, baby. Summit, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think there's been a lot of justifiable criticism of the draft here uh, from Cloud9 coming into this, uh, blind picking both your solo lanes, having the, a pretty big blue side advantage. Now, many teams around the world will first pick the lease in, but it, there were a lot of potential power picks that were left on the table here, including Zeri, including Twisted Fate, which didn't end up being selected at all. Seems like there was a lot of really weird priority when you lose the day. But like if I'm Cloud9 and I lost the literally the day before to Malphite and I'm I have a Kumo Summit matchup, I might think to myself, what are possible ways that Kumo could beat us in this matchup? And maybe one of them is blind picking Trindamir and then having the Malphite be available to you. Yeah. I, I don't really understand why the Trindamir was selected so early in the draft. I don't, uh, Kumo has played it, yes, but it's been not super threatening, I would think, if you were, if you were Summit. It seemed like they were trying to style on them a little bit, which is very strange, considering that this match actually did potentially matter for first seed. Well, I, I, personally, when I look at the draft, I, I think that the reason why they're they're going with the early pick Trindamir um, could be one of the like issues that Summit has right now with his champion pool, um, because Jace and Nar were actually sure. banned one two um, yep. against them. So with three bands or with with two out of three bands coming in for top lane specifically, and those like carry champions, if you want, <laughs> if you if you don't have eighty champions prepared mid. That means that like Kennen is going to have reduced value uh, generally within the draft, which is like the other pick that that Summit has been going in um, on. And a lot of people that take Malphite will end up like drafting it, maybe like fourth pick, fifth pick, something like that. They will draft it this early. So I feel like Summit kind of ran out of like good blindable champion. And, and maybe there's a situation where Trinomir is banned four or five and then they don't have anything that they could carry uh through top with that's an AD champion left. So I think that's one of the issues that, that they run into sure. here because, because you have like the, the graves yesterday, right? Was the answer, right? The graves yesterday, it was the answer. And he just ran it down. He played like shit on graves, which would be the, the other AD champion. So I think the problem here is some, it's champion pool getting pinched a bit. Whereas before it felt like he could just pick Nar Jason to anyone and just automatically win the game. That I, I can see that, but it's also a difference between Kumo and Someday and who you're playing and considering not just the draft, but the player skill level that you are going against. And I think considering like 
that the Graves pick may have been problematic yesterday is not, I mean, you can still ban out the Malphite, right? Like if you look at the bans, banning Tom Kench, even though Aphromoo has, it's, it's always been one of Aphromoo's better picks. Yep. Are you really super threatened by a, a FlyQuest Tom Kench? Is that th th like the main point of concern that you have? It just felt like in the bands, they were over-respecting FlyQuest and in the picks, they were, they, I mean, they were kind of under-respecting them in certain mm -hmm. ways. I mean, I think which I find if, to be a weird combination. I think that if they end up banning uh, the Malphite on third, because so so what you're saying is like they first ban Gragas, enemy team responds with Jace, then they ban Syndra, enemy team responds with Nar, and then they. I think go there's also a question for, about whether you even ban the Gragas because the, I, I mean we don't know what Summit's complete champion pool is, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but so and then if you go the Malphite, they respond with Hecarim. Then I feel like you kind of have to first pick Trend, which I, I think it could be viable in this draft. Um, it would be interesting, but yeah, I think that then they would they'd probably have to first pick Trin because the best two Trin answers uh, right now are Gragas and Malphite. You can play Jax, but Jax is like very like fringe most of the time where it can work, but it's it it requires a lot of attention. You have to play differently when there's a Jax in the game. Um, yeah, so then I think that then you'd probably have to first pick the Trindamir and have that be the carry point. But I feel like this was like one of the times where I'm like, hmm, maybe Summit did get lightly exposed. I mean, the other picks that, that you cut that come to mind are maybe like Camille, for example. Like, I think that Camille is something that he could play uh, well, but I just feel like, like Camille is not going to be the same dominant laner that like a Jace or a Nar will be like, if you know, they are just isolated um, with players of like equal skill. So I feel like just right now, cloud Nine has had a lot of really weird games that have just been carried by Summit being super far ahead. And this game, he was really far ahead, but like the other members are actually going to have to start performing better for Cloud9 to win games because having Summit just completely shit on the enemy top laner and be like five plates up, two solo kills, maybe taking tier two by himself. Like those games are not like going to happen that much when you get into playoffs and people are playing, uh, you know, with the idea in mind that they need to contain Summit. Um, so when you look at a lot of Cloud9's games, I don't think that this is like, that different than um, other other games that they've had. The only difference is that Summit is not just Astro fucking stomping top lane. Um, even games like, for example, the Immortals game where we all flamed Revenge, right? If if Summit did not have that lead on Nar versus Trindamir top lane and, you know, take all the plates, kill them, take the turrets, whatever, I think they lose that game. I think they were just losing other places on the map. So like Cloud9 has been pretty inconsistent like with between mid and bot lane for a large portion of the second part of the split, but it just hasn't really bit them in the ass yet because someone's been able to carry anyway. Interesting. Just a couple of stats to throw out here for summit, uh, seven games on NAR, uh, two on graves, uh, Trindamir and Camille. And then, uh, with those seven games, 71% of the time, uh, blind, blind picking it. He's the one that's getting countered most of the time. The times where he wasn't was Malphite, Aatrox, and Jace. So, uh, well, I, Jace I, and I, I, are just off. much more safe blind picks. That's the point, right? Hmm. Right, 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 right. Uh, I, I like that take though, and I think if, if as as we've hit kind of extensively in this specific game, uh, mm -hmm. if they to get him on a different champ, they have to change the whole composition around and not have a, you know, uh, AD in the top side, have him play a tank or a bruiser or AP and then figure it out that way. Um, all right. Well, I like the fact that it looks like Cloud9 isn't, isn't as untouchable as we thought maybe at some points in the season. And, and it isn't them just kind of doofing around and throwing a game around. And so for you at home, make sure to uh, let us know what you think is playing in this Cloud9 roster uh, by leaving a comment in this video and subscribing to our Deserto channel so that we can catch up with Astralis. Come on, man. We're, 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 trying to, we're not trying to be the dignitas of content here. We're trying to be uh, the TL Cloud9. And let's oh, no, start don't by... Worry. This, this one episode over. will get more views than their entire channel in League of Legends up until this point. So don't, don't worry about that. We, don't have, we won't be the Dignitas. I know I was on... No, I can tell you for a fact I was on the Dignitas YouTube recently. It is depressing. Okay, so. <laughs>
like 400 oh. views for like produced more content. or less depressing than the evil geniuses youtube because that one's really uh depressing. more depressing i feel like evil geniuses youtube uh is actually getting some views you know what let's try to become more like the tsm subreddit right now after their winning streak they're going into the off season one game winning streak baby beat uh, one in el Clasico. uh it's sky high let's try to reach those levels of euphoria here on our channel uh one thing that i wanted to touch on here as we close the chapter on the regular season is we have the uh regular season awards coming out uh, i think my vote for uh the media is due tomorrow so today if you're watching it uh you'll get to see it so i want to get your thoughts give me your all pro rosters for um the lcs regular season okay i, I could do my i already i already had mine uh done essentially so all right if i'm going all pro regular season i'm taking summit top uh jungle blabber mid bjergsen uh ad carry han sama support core jj I think it's like pretty one sided and like all of those. I don't even think that there's that much discussion. Like maybe some people could say Berserker over Han Sama, but I think Berserker in like the last half um, wasn't as good as Han Sama. I think the last couple of weeks for Han Sama like uh, put him ahead for me uh, in general. So yeah, that's uh, that's what I got. I think there may be some level of argument to the Bjergsen pick because he's been less TL has been less dependent on him as a carry, but he has been playing the meta and playing his role within that team very well. I think if your criteria is uh, more of like the, the person who's had the greatest, I, I agree with Bjergsen by the way, but I think that if the criteria is the person who's had the greatest kind of effect on their roster, you could potentially make a Tukui argument. Um, because he has been compared in terms of being instrumental to a lot of FlyQuest's wins. Um, I would say there's an argument, but I, I think mid lane is pretty bad in NA now overall. And oh, it's really bad. Yeah, the players who have best fit the meta have been Fudge and Bjergsen, and Bjergsen has been better than Fudge. Yeah. Uh, then let's go down one more because one point of topic that happened with the LEC was like, hey, there were a couple that were close. What would be it? Let's let's take that whole uh, agreed upon all pro team there. What would be your second team all pro then for the for uh, top jung mid uh, bot and support? I guess the closest one would be like our uh, berserker at the bot lane. But then where do we go from there? So I'd go berserker at the bot lane uh, support. I go someday top. Yeah, I would go someday top over Blippo. I would go closer jungle over uh, Santorin. Um, I'd probably go fudge second team, personally. Uh, and then support is, like, kind of interesting. Um, like, Ole's been running it. He's had some good games. I don't think Vulcan's been playing super well. I don't think who he's been playing super well. Afro? I think, no, actually, no. I know who I'd have second team uh, for support. This is going to probably shock a lot of people. I'd probably have Biofrost. Based off this season, I think he has had. He actually a, has had a good season. He's had he's had a very good split on a very bad team, and he's been like a win con. And you know, like in draft, people are targeting him. People ban the Caitlyn so he can't go Caitlyn Lux, like because yeah, I mean that's just that's the combo. That's the only way that you get the Lux. They've been banning his Tom Kench a lot. So I would go Biofrost actually, all pro second team. I think I'd take Ole. Just he does have int games, but he also has had some pretty big upside games. And I'd take Takui over Fudge in in mid lane. I'm trying to think. Uh, no one else close at jungle. It's just closer there. No inspired. People, no river. People, no, I don't think. I mean, it would be Santorin. <laughs> I'm Santorin. I mean, I just okay. think that Santorin. Like, I haven't been as impressed this season with him um as i have been with uh, with him like in other seasons i just feel like he doesn't really gank anymore which was one of like his biggest strengths as a player he was the guy that would go red buff to opposite side level two gank on trundle that was his thing he got he did that like every game in 2020 and it would just somehow always work like he was always finding these unique uh gank opportunities by varying his pathing um, and now it just feels like he's almost never doing that. He's just kind of like sitting there. He's just farming. He's part of the team. He does objectives when he should be doing objectives. And then he's just there for team fights. So I feel like he's really taken a step back when it comes to like making stuff happen. And I think this is one of the things that, uh, that Blabber's actually done pretty well this split. I feel like he's been one of the only junglers that have actually stayed active and like continued to play the jungle role, not just like 
uh, a, a ward where you're just chilling and you're farming the jungle on cooldown and Harold spawns in eight minutes. Okay, you start Harold. Oh, you got bot prior. Oh, maybe we get a five minute dragon. Feels like that's what jugglers are just doing this split. I also okay. think that, you know, someday in closer were the bright spots when 100 Thieves was playing a lot worse earlier in the split. Um, so, you know, the reason why 100 Thieves doesn't have probably have a worse record than they do right now is because they were able to pull out some games and someday's performance in particular has been really very good. Um, very good. You know, I think I think there is potentially an argument for someday, you know, if you really after this last week, I don't think it's inconceivable that you could argue for someday over Summit. I still think it's Summit. I still think okay. Summit should get MVP of the entire league, but I think at least it was a closer race after this last week. I I, th I I think it just feels bad that it was so clear that Summit was MVP. And now that after this last week, it felt like mm, he's still MVP had a bad week. But is there anyone else that would be MVP? No, like I mean, it just, it just is what Not it really. is. He could have literally just ran it straight down mid for all three games this week and still been probably MVP. There's no one else that's had close Look, to that effect on their team. Here, here's here's the real question for you, Degon. Why is it possible for red side to ban both J nar and jace and leave up so many power picks to blue side and nobody else on cloud nine can fucking carry these games that's the real that's question. a good one that's, that's good the one. real question for me like you shouldn't be able to use two of those bans on red side targeting summit when as you pointed out he frequently blind picks top lane anyway so yeah. if you're red side you should be able to play a counter pick like that level of like band draw is pretty amazing. And I think it says very bad things about the rest of cloud nine, because even when they first pick Zeri as they did against their, in their game against hundred thieves, they get their faces smashed in. Yeah. And it feels like that's just a pick that berserker just doesn't play super well. Um, when you look at other like top tier Zeri players, it's like, you cannot give them Zeri. They're just going to carry the whole fucking game. That, that's how it feels. So most teams are just normally have to ban Zeri. But if you look at like their game versus FlyQuest, how do they have blue side, right? They first pick Lee Sin to deny it from Jose. Okay. Enemy team takes Nautilus and then Zeri is just completely off the table for Cloud9. Their mentality is you take Nautilus, oh, Zeri is just unplayable now. Where it's like, yes, Nautilus is good into Zeri, but it's like when Callista was super fucking broken in previous seasons. Just because the enemy team took Nautilus, it didn't mean, oh, it didn't mean, oh, fuck. Yeah, we're not going to take Callista anymore. Like this shit that just like wins bot that gives us Dragon Prio where we can just stack Drakes and then get like an early soul and win the game. Like if you were a good Callista team, you still took Callista. So it's the same exact situation that we've seen just with slightly different champions. Champions. But the fact that like not only is Zeri like going down to uh to the uh four or five ban ban phase, it's like they're banning it themselves. They're banning the Zeri. So I don't really know what to say about that. It just feels like uh you know there's there's a drop off between Berserker on Aphilios and Ezreal, and then his next level of picks, which is which would be like Jinx. Jinx, which I think is still good enough that it's like up there. It's like, okay, Jinx is broken enough. You don't play it as well as you play Aphelios, but it's still Jinx. And then Zeri is like, you don't really play Zeri, do you? All yeah, right. Well, I mean, that's uh, my criticism of them. Like they just don't have, uh, they don't play all the power picks. And I think it's you know, clear because I mean, the other thing too is FlyQuest just did the exact same bans that 100 Thieves did. Like, they just literally ripped off the bans from 100 Thieves because it worked the day before. Mm -hmm. And they were on red side, just like 100 Thieves was. And you see the result. Like, there, there wasn't a lot of threat amongst the power picks that were available. Like, TF fell all the way through the draft. Yep. Which is inconceivable, I think, in a good region. Free scouting here for uh, 100 Thieves and uh, Papa Smithy, Reaper, and the rest of the squad as they go also, into Also, their... Blue Side is just a crazy advantage right now. I mean, we've seen a lot of pretty heavily favored Blue Sides in many of the playoff games around the world. Mm -hmm. Because top lane counter... Essentially what happens is like Blue Side becomes really good when counter pick doesn't feel like very useful. Like, so, like sometimes we end up in metas where like there's a lot of things that people consider like super, super hard counter picks. So you'll have like this dynamic between like Renekton being like strong, but then like Orin is good into Renekton. And then like, you know, like Aatrox will be good into Orin, but then Aatrox will lose to Renekton. So you have like these like three picks that are like constantly rotating. So if you get the final pick there and like 
you know, one of them's not banned, you can get a, a massive advantage out of it. Right now, it feels like people can just like blind their whole team comp. Like mid laners don't care about counter pick really. They can just blind Victor if they want. And they're probably just going to be okay with, with blinding Victor. Top laner's going to just blind Nar and Jace. And they're probably just going to be okay in any matchups um, that you could, you could get. Even in top tier regions, we see teams just take Jace and give the other team Malphite. And it doesn't really feel that good if you're a good team around playing against Malphite because Malphite does have distinct weaknesses. I mean, look but, at the Gen G, look at the Gen G, uh, Dawan Kia game that happened. Like, yeah, Bird all sucks, but you know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, we know Bird all sucks, <laughs> but also in the, just as a point in the draft, uh, later on in the draft, they intentionally select Kaisa as a response to an early Malphite pick so that they at least have more mixed mm -hmm. and magic damage coming out of the bot lane, which then forced, well, forced is a strong word caused Birdall to like buy chem tank Merc treads force of nature, which is yeah not ideal. Yeah, and also caught it. It also forced him to play like shit. So you know, <laughs> at least now it's not just me and Monty being old people that are just saying that this like eighteen year old like young Korean boy is like not playing excellent top lane. Now it's Dom one two that are on the train. They're like, God damn. Like, all right, we're subbing. We got to sub like, this guy. In. <laughs> yeah, we, are, we are done with Remember, you remember game Hoya, three. you haven't seen him for two months, but here he is. He's back at game no. three of, the, of our, of our you, most important match of the season. <laughs> you can tell like different substitutions and like what they mean. Like there's some substitutions where you'll look at it and you'll be like, this, this isn't is because this is, isn't because the player is actually like underperforming. It's just they need something else, you know, like they need a different jungler to come into the series because of like what they're trying to execute. They have got like normally you'd have like the control juggler and then like the early game beast, like aggressive psychopath jungler. And you'll be like, you know what? It's not that, that one of them was bad. It was just that the other one uh, might suit the game better. But the bird all substitution just looked just looked like he played like such shit in game two on Malphite. That they're like, dude, if you're choking on Malphite, like we just got to get you out of there. Like <laughs> that's it. It looked like a pure like performance. Like they thought he was just choking so hard they needed to put somebody in that type of substitution. Gotcha. Uh, this is looking at something interesting. Is at the LCK playoffs, they already seeded third, fourth. Monty, how? What? Why? What, how did they do that? Why do is it because? Seated. Oh, you mean the, uh, so you're the noticing points. that one of them finished fourth and one of them finished third, even though they didn't it's, play any games? Yeah. It's just based on their uh, record at the end of the season, right? That's what I assumed. Yeah, I think it must be based on their playoff seating. Uh, Dom one's yeah. third, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, Dom, Dom one's third. third. Uh, it's and a, it's, it's really just a difference in championship points and money, but mm -hmm. I would assume that was based off of um, their playoff seating. Yeah, regular Yeah. Season. All right, I'll, I'll we'll take a look. At that I, I don't know the answer to your question, uh, but for sure. But that would be my assumption. Yeah, sorry for the distraction there. It was just we were we were talking about it the is weird. It is LCK, weird. and I was like, wait, why is it already filled out? Or like, why don't why don't they have just equal uh, points yeah. there? Uh, I mean, the bigger question is why does LCK refuse to have double elimination? Like, I feel like LCK playoffs is like. I don't know. Such like they just blue ball you the entire time. It's like, wow, that was an amazing Dom one versus Gen G series. I would love to have it. Oh, never mind. It's just, it's just gonna it's be uh, Gen G versus versus T one in the finals. Okay, T one's probably gonna smash them, and that's it. It's like five series, and they do it like in such a weird way. They're like four games in like five days. Okay, and then in one week we have finals, and then that's it. You know, like it just seems so strange to me. I don't know. Yeah, inside Monty, please. I mean, the I think the the answer to the question is because they have a double round robin best of three format. That the assumption is that the you know teams have had a million chances already to prove themselves, and so the playoffs don't need to be as robust. Now, I disagree with this clearly because I'm the ultimate double, double elimination uh, enthusiast, and uh, you know ho still hopeful that we get that for some of. Riot's tournaments. By the way, Riot in Valorant has now proved not only that they know double elimination exists, but that they know that double elimination four team group stages exist. They have discovered GSL groups, which gives me hope that someday they may apply these things to League and of Legends. They said they they would consider it for League of Legends. Ooh. Yeah, I, I like how they, they say that we considered it. So then when it doesn't happen, they'll be like, yeah, we considered it. And we considered that it was a, it was a dumb <laughs> fucking decision. Like, so we didn't do we, it. We considered it. And we decided that moving between four different cities for the vast minority of viewers who watch it live is a better experience for everyone. Fuck off with that. 
Uh, mm -hmm. As to, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think the the playoff format is shit. I think that the games happen too fast so that teams don't have adequate preparation time uh, with the exception of the difference between the semifinals and the finals. But I do think that there is a there is an argument you could make based on the format that because teams have had so much of a chance to get into those positions uh, because of the regular season. Now, the other argument, Don, is why they can't be spread out more is because the LCK has already artificially shortened their season by accelerating the schedule that they normally do uh, because of the Asia Games qualifiers that LCK is bizarrely concerned with uh, that are happening uh, between the end of the season at Worlds, and because, as I understand it, the players of the LCK, of which maybe some LPL players who are Korean will be se selected for the Korean roster at the Asia Games. We don't know that. Uh, who's going to be selected? Uh, could be uh, some Chinese pl or players in the LPL. Um, so it seems weird to accelerate the schedule when you. it may not even be all the players from your own league, and at max, it's going to be six of them anyway. Uh, but the players wanted a break. And so the players are going to get their break after the playoffs, then practice for the qualifiers, the preliminary matches for the Asian games, because the Asian games aren't happening until later this year before worlds. Um, and then they will go to MSI, but the, you know, it's weird that we're going to have the end of LCK. What on April 2nd, right? Mm. Yep. And MSI dates still haven't been announced guys. Yep. <laughs> and it's my understanding, it's my understanding that it's not going to be until mid or late May. Interesting. Well, generally, it's at the beginning of May. So like, I think, over the it, I think it's going to be delayed a little bit this year. I, I believe it. But when they made when the LCK made this decision to give the break, they were probably under the assumption, yeah, sure, for the last like, yeah. however many like what f every iteration of MSI has started beginning of May. So you know, we'll, we'll do that. That's, that's nice, Degon. But considering LCK should probably know the best about when MSI is going to happen because it's in and it Korea. Affect them the, the last, the least, because they're like not having to travel. You know? Like, All right. you could theory, you could, they don't have to move. So you could theoretically do the finals pretty close to the start of MSI. Yeah, it's not like they have to like quarantine entrance to Korea. Like they are in Korea. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't know. I, so you know what? I, I would I, imagine I, they're the ones planning MSI as look, well. So that, I mean, if anybody should know the dates, it should be them. I, I would. Guess. Them you don't think it's riot in North America that has nothing to do with Korea, possibly taking control of I mean, it and gonna give autonomy to Riot Korea or the LCK to make that happen, Monty? I mean, it might be. I, Riot is notorious, right? NA is notorious for fucking with other regions. So that's possible. That's, po that's certainly possible. Yeah. I mean, you know what? I, I have a second thought on this. I, I was asking for more because like, you know, theoretically, like my like competitive integrity side and like my hype for for League of Legends um, kind of came out and I was like, damn, like that, that Gen G versus Dom One series, like maybe I, I'm also like, I actually like Dom One more as a team than, than Gen G. So I was kind of hoping Dom One won. So I, I would, I would like to see them again. So like that side kind of took over, but in reality, you know, it makes it a lot easier for me to just keep up with LCK and watch all of their playoffs when they have like five series. So, you yeah, know, it's not that hard. <laughs> yeah, on, on second thought, you know, I think it's fine the way it is. I think this is actually optimal. Um, for viewership experience, like <laughs> no, no, Dom, you've got it wrong. What we want is uh single elimination to return to LCS and LEC, and then for double elimination in LCK to maximize the number of enjoyable games. True, true. Okay, single elimination playoffs is what Monty's advocating for. Interesting. Also, four teams, four teams only in LCS playoffs. <laughs> four teams honestly, only, single I, I'm, I'm three like... best of fives. Let's go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'd, I'd honestly be fine with that. Like, unironically, I feel like the only teams that you really need to watch are EG, 100 Thieves, C9, yes. DL, right? In NA. Like, truth. <laughs> FlyQuest and Golden Guardians, like, it, I mean, yeah. I, they're they're, they're going to be there. They're going to be there. They're going to be. Yeah, I'm crushed quickly. every time, Monty. I'm crushed every time. <laughs> yeah, no, you saw it. <laughs> yeah. All Here's right. I, I'm trying to think of, like, an equivalent exchange because... Uh, my favorite was the game five blind pick like that as a viewer in the chaos there super fun without knowing and then still getting a lot of the same matches what would we have to trade to get that back like i feel like or what what would we have to do to get that back as, as entertaining as that was i think it's not that strategic it, prob it probably was good that that went away uh, yeah i i was sad but if you look at 
what would happen in like the modern era. First off, it would be, I mean, nobody ever practiced for it when it happened back in the day anyway. So it was always mm-hmm. kind of scuffed and weird. Um, it's not tr- training you for anything that you might experience in other regions, which obviously raises the question of if if we're just going to eliminate things that aren't relevant for all regions, then we should probably just get the get rid of best of ones at Worlds. I would fucking love that. I thought you were going somewhere else with that. I thought you were going to say we're just going to eliminate NALCS. I was ready for it. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not too. <laughs> but but, uh, but, uh, but if, right. if, if, if independent regions, if we can't have, if Korea can't decide to have blind pick best of fives anymore because it's being enforced on them by Riot because, you know, ostensibly it's not something that it confuses viewers and also is not something that any other region would, you know, they're not going to do it internationally. You're trying to standardize the viewer experience. Then best of the majority, the vast majority of global viewership of league of legends is confused as fuck by best of ones. Hmm. Look, why, why not just make this uh, like for, for LCK, like, if we're going to just try to make it a little bit better, they could literally just add two matches and it would suddenly make the, the playoffs so much better. All they need to do is then have the two teams that just lost, which would be yep. Dom Juan There's and, and uh, the Freaks. <laughs> they just play one match there and then the loser of T1 and yep. and uh, Genji just plays yep. Agreed. probably Dom Juan. And then, you know, then you just get the final. Now, people always complain that it's like, well, the team that wins in the winner's bracket doesn't get double elimination technically then happened to fpx two times last year where they entered from the winner's bracket lost only one series and they lost both finals but i think that in general like that makes for like just that one little change those two extra matches make for like a whole world of difference in terms of the scenarios that happen i mean if you look at what would have happened in lpl suddenly you have fpx like winning twice like they would have just looked like by far the best lpl team it would if if they ended up just having no double elimination starting in in uh the semifinals and part of the reason why lpl was so exciting was that rng and edg both lost their first possible match to send them into the double elimination so they had to like run the lower part of that mini gauntlet Which is like there three more best of fives by the way so when uh, this is why i love i can tell people who have never had any esports experience whatsoever because they're like there's no advantage to you know going through the losers brackets like you have to you have you face elimination like two three more times like who wants to prepare for three more best of fives because you were eliminated early on in the bracket like it's an insane disadvantage was- to have to battle back it was some great fucking best of fives too that we got. Like, like we got some really insane matches um, from RNG in that in that spring before they got to MSI. So, I don't know. I I just feel like that small little change, and it's not even like you have to add an extra like massive week or anything crazy like that. Like you just literally like just extend the like the week you started on Monday. You just run like four series and then two more. Then you have that week break. Then you have the finals. Then you go into your, you know, MSI and qualifiers for the Asian games and all that stuff. Well, well, Dom, they can't do that because up to six of the players need to rest uh, before they may be selected for uh, Asian game qualifiers, of which they will easily qualify for anyway, because it's not going to be facing any of the they will easily qualify for the Asian games in fucking League of Legends, because the only team the Korean team would actually lose to potentially is China. And is China. That's, that <laughs> and like both those teams are going to qualify, so we don't have to worry about it. So that's why this whole thing is ridiculous. Yes. All Imagine right. like the Korean team, like the most legendary team ever assembled. You look at the fucking roster. It's going to be like Canyon, Karia, Guma Yushi, uh, top lane, you're probably going to have Keen or Zeus or something like that. And mid lane, you're going to have Faker or Showmaker. That, or, or Chovy, that team, imagine them losing to like Indonesia or some shit. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> and and like, by the way, I think, I, think there should be a, I think there should be a different rule where if instead of when they win the gold medal, right, they, they get to be exempted from their two years of military service. If they don't qualify for the Asian Games, they should be forced into military service immediately. That's that's what <laughs> oh I would argue. God. Holy <laughs> shit. Jesus. I mean, it would never happen. So, you know, like, won't that, rule, <laughs> that rule could just be there. Uh, just in case you didn't know, it is Koma leading that squad. Yes. Yeah, he's leading the squad. Uh, Korea has had an open what is the quote here open recruitment process that began at the beginning of the year uh 
I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not fully up to date on the uh, Filipino uh, League of Legends scene and how they're doing in 2022, but I don't think it's that organized. Uh, we'll just Rascal leave it at that. Jester is going to fucking run this shit from Japan, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, anyway, anyway. I, I think I think that when you oh, by the way, Zom, this is the that's the other thing is like they could pick rookie and Viper for all the fuck we know. Yeah, they could certainly like, rookie. <laughs> You listed yeah. three oh, of them. I, I think the, I think the rookie is in really good form right now. But I would just like, I mean, when you hear Korean fans talk about like who they want representing them, which I think actually probably does matter to um, you know, the, whoever's going to represent Korea in the Asian games, it feels like they are high on like they they're Faker and then maybe Chovy. You know, like like Faker is too legendary and then maybe Chovy. It feels like rookie doesn't have the same like amount of like Korea. It seems like almost when I talk to Korean fans that they view rookie as Chinese. Like he's an outsider because he's played in LPL for so long. Like they don't rate him. Like he's been playing as well as he's been playing right now. Yep. And oh, no, I agree. Still, he like, probably should be chosen <laughs> right now. I think that there's a, a very good argument. You could make that he is the best mid laner in the entire world. But like, if you say that to a Korean fan, they'll scoff at that shit. They'll be like, huh. Chovy showmaker faker. Like, hello? No. Yeah. Also, I think there's probably a pretty powerful argument you can make about the top laner also being a Korean player from the LPL at the present time. Are you top, lane, rich? top lane in Korea is not not looking great right now. Uh, we're, we're, who, who are you going to say was that that top laner? I was just wondering. From LPL? Yeah. Probably the shy or rich. Yeah. I mean, rich got all pro first team. I think that's that's shocking. Um, but I mean, he played really well. I think he's he's been smurfing, so I guess we'll see. We'll see at MSI what what ends up happening if V five does make it. Oh, I mean, they've looked great. It's been a lot of fun to watch V five. Let's wrap up here on the LCK playoffs as we kind of touched on it here for for we touched on uh, LCK. Uh, all as we said earlier, all the matches kind of condensed. Four different best of five series condensed here from Wednesday to Sunday. Uh, we had our uh, our Brian's of Reddit come through and get their, you know, thanks for making playoffs award against uh, Dan Wankia. Uh, and then the other match, Kwang, Kwangdong Freaks taking down DRX in a back and forth series. Uh, basically, each team trading one and one. And the Freaks beat uh, DRX there. Uh, Monty, insight on that. I, mean, I don't really want to. I think these games are really flippy. I think DRX, like, I would have rather have seen them advance, especially considering how one sided the Kwangdong Freaks T1 series was. Uh, I I prefer watching DRX overall uh, as a team. So I guess I found their performance in this series like pretty disappointing overall, even though I think that Fate and Keen have had pretty have had pretty good seasons in the LCK. Uh, I was I was definitely hoping for more than that. Yep. Uh, that that was that short series. We'll move right along then to the semifinals and the big matchups that that we yeah. had. I think people, people want to hear us talk about Gen G. Damon. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. That, yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> I thought I thought Damon's first match versus uh versus Reddit Brion Reddit Brian. I, I I literally don't even know how to pronounce the name because I literally only call them Reddit Brian on stream. <laughs> I watched all those games. I thought that like Canyon is playing super fucking well. Like I was actually really hyped for for Damon Gen G after the series because I was like Canyon is playing deceptively well like part of part of the reason why it doesn't look like he's even playing better in these games is because of the fact that his team is really like not on the same page as, as him like a lot of times he's doing the right thing and you can just tell that like Bertol is just not ready when he ganks top for like Canyon to flash on the guy or something like that like they're just not on the same page um but Canyon is like already in fucking beast mode so yeah I mean if we, when we get into the Genji and, and Dom Juan series here I really think that Canyon's like I think that he's showing like showing himself to be the best jungler in Korea, like deserving of that all pro uh, first team slot. Like he is so fucking good. So fucking good. This guy. Yeah, let's do it. And, uh, and also, uh, like, un unlike the last time. So you'll remember that there was the upset that happened in the final week of competition between Dom one and and Fred at Breon, right? Mm -hmm. Where Fred at Breon won. And we um, were talking about this on that show. And I was like, just ban the fucking lease in and don't let Umti just carry these games. What do they do? There's ban ban the lease in on the blue side. Mm -hmm. And you know, all of a sudden we we don't see that 
same level of performance. Also, Canyon, as Dom stated, stepped up big time. And it was great in that in the Gen G series as well. Yep. So in that series, uh, DM1 Kia take the early lead, go uh, up one. They're on match point twice here after game three. Uh, can't close that out here with Gen G that win the last two games. Uh, when those games uh, play out, what are some of the big moments that kind of that people can look back to if they miss this series here, uh, Dom? I mean, game five was like pretty much as depressing as a game can go for a jungler, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I think that there's like some significant balancing issues in League of Legends overall right now, which were really evidenced by this game. I think that this is like the game that you show anyone. Um, yeah. If people are, are talking about like our comeback mechanics too strong in the game, because there's no way that you should be able to do that to an enemy jungler. Do what, do what Canyon did to Peanut in this game with the Nidalee versus uh, Hecarim matchup. And actually like lose it as quickly as they did like sure i think scaling should exist in the game but if you're double somebody cs in the jungle why is he one level behind you like how how does that work i mean obviously i know how it works is because when you counter jungle the enemy and you kill their camps their camps level up and then there's comeback experience in the game it was re-added um sometime last year uh didn't really matter too much uh for a while but now like you're starting to see in this type of meta, like why people are picking Hecarim because Hecarim's biggest weakness is getting behind early, but it doesn't really matter because if you just go this chem tank uh, build and you have such high base damage, you're still going to be useful. So like they just get outscaled eventually. Obviously, I think their draft is terrible. Like Jace mid, I've never been a fan of. Jace mid, Nidalee, Renekton, this is the most like sinner draft possible. When this game was going on, the first thing I tweeted was uh, that if Domwon ended up losing this game, I think somebody should have immediately did a wellness check on LS. I would have really feared for his life <laughs> if uh, if Domwon ended up winning this game. This was like all the champions he hates together in in one draft. <laughs> but like, come on, like you got like this has to be a win. The fact that when I was watching this game, as somebody who watches a ton of league, at the point where Domwon was seven k up, I know the broadcast. They're like, I'm gonna shave my head if they lose. Like it's in the fucking bag. Like I was watching this game. I'm like, shit, seven k gold at like 18 minutes. I think it's even. Honestly, I think Gen G might win. And then Gen G dies one time. And I immediately go to Twitter and I tweet, oh, by the way, or uh, Domon dies one time. I go to Twitter and then immediately the first thing I tweet out is like, oh, Gen G just won the game. And, and then it's like, it's not even close from that point. If you throw even a little bit with objective bounties, the massive bounties that you have on yourself, if you throw even a little bit in this meta, you're just going to lose the game. And this is why so many people are drafting scaling. It's why so many people blind pick Victor the entire season. I mean, the, the, the problem with this game is that if you can't win from the position with as few mistakes, and it, it's not that it's not that Don Juan didn't make mistakes, but with as few mistakes as they made it, how fast the game turned around, it's this is just the this is just the massive warning sign to the entire world that you should not be drafting comps like this. Um, which is disappointing because I think that there should be room for very well executed early game compositions as there has been in the past. But the number of rubber band mechanics and comeback mechanics that now exist within this game is ridiculous. You have jungle XP uh, yeah. comeback mechanics. You have individual bounty comeback mechanics. You have objective bounty comeback mechanics. And it's not that Dom One did a bad job of snowballing this game either. They got every plate on the map. Did they prioritize gold and turrets? Yes, but they did it really well by playing smart, grouping around Zig, Satchel Charge, really pushing towers, using Herald in certain ways as to not destroy inhibitors. So they were very deliberate about not using a Herald bot lane because they didn't want to accidentally charge an inhibitor and give that opportunity for Gen G to like willingly lose an inhibitor early on and start funneling gold. Um, they used it on the top side instead in order to take out the tier two turret. And I can't remember if it crashed tier three or not, but um, there there were a lot of choices that were made in this game by Dom Juan to accelerate, especially, and I think intelligently, did it open up an opportunity for Ruler to get a lot of farm in the game? Yes, like he was about 100 CS up on Dokdam, but that shouldn't have mattered considering the amount of global gold that they were generating on the map. Um, I think there were other factors that came into play. Poor skill shots by Don Juan in, in the mid and late game. Um, obviously, getting Canyon shut down by Ruler was giving him a thousand more gold on the shutdown was 
highly problematic, losing fights at inopportune times. Should Dom Juan probably have focused Dragon earlier and tried to stack that objective? Yes, I think we can say in retrospect. But when I was watching the game, it didn't feel that way because they were they were being effective on the map in terms of getting towers. So yeah. it just seemed like a choice they were making and not one that was going to be heavily punishable later on. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that people forget is that like you don't need these artificial comeback mechanics in the game to, no. to have it be that there are comeback mechanics in the game. Like there always because, was a comeback mechanic with a composition like the one Dom one was playing. It existed naturally because gold is more valuable on carry champs. So the more gold that is in total in the game tends to balance out the, you know, tends to favor the scaling compositions, right? Yeah, definitely. And then like, just like if you look at how the map set up, like when your turrets are gone and the enemy is pushing deeper, like it becomes easier for you to like control your own waves and things like that. Um, and like your the game is easier. Like your when your map shrinks, you you're still okay to like farm lanes. Like it's not like you get that much of an of an advantage off farming like the enemy team's jungle that you could choke a team out to like the extent where they just can't play the game. Like the game never felt like that to me in all my years playing where it just felt like, like you were guaranteed to lose just based off a team getting an, an early game advantage. Um, like even versus like some of the best players, you know, like it never felt like it was actually that extremely. Like, I think that there was enough comeback mechanics already in the game. And I feel like these comeback mechanics that they're now adding, like the fact that they, they added back into the game, uh, comeback experience I've, or, uh, yeah, comeback experience. In, in the game, I just feel like that's just really weird. I think comeback XP is just strange in general, like, because then you end up in this weird situation where it's like, okay, so if I, if I have my camps up and he has his camps up and I'm a jungler, if I take his camps and then my camps, that means that his camps are going to respawn first and be higher level. So unless I'm consistently able to do that, I'm like kind of helping him in a weird fucking way. Like, how am I helping him by counter jungling him? Like, I don't like that idea to start with, right? And then when you then benefit him for being it's like, it's level, like it's reverse like, minion denial from Dota. Yeah, it's like, wait, so like, do I just <laughs> so is he further behind if I just like let him farm his jungle? Like, it just it seems fucking weird. And the yeah. other part of it is like. Canyon should be able to play his fucking Nidalee. Like, yes. that should be a thing. Like, <laughs> this is like what you watch League of Legends for. You want to watch like at least when I watch League of Legends, I want to see players that are specifically good on champions be able to play them and see things clash. That was the only part that was like beautiful about the, the blind pick game five in Korea was the idea of it was that everyone gets to play their best champions. So you get to see like, you know, people play things that would normally be banned from them. Um, so it'd be hype. So if you had like a guy that would like, you know, Viper, for example, and he was like a Riven one trick and then Riven like is banned against him every single game and then you get to blind pick game five, he gets to play as Riven and show how good he is, show his, his uh, mechanics on the champion. Canyon did that in this game. And it's like, it's better for Canyon to play something that he's like half as good at that's in the meta that doesn't need to be comped around and you could just play like these random scaling comps than for him to play what he's actually like one of the best, if not the best, I would say he's just the best Nidalee player in the world, um, which I think that he should just be able to play. Like that should be something that is at least viable. Like he, yes, he should probably have to play a little bit better on Nidalee than, you know, another champion like it shouldn't be dead even because Nidalee is like obviously a champion that needs to have the identity of getting ahead and you know farming camps and, and having a CS lead like that sure like I'm okay with that but like this is just so extreme you know like yeah. like well, it's just you, so terrible right now when when you compare your point to LS's tweet where it's 91 CS for Nidalee 43 CS for uh uh the Hecarim which is a meta champ that Peanut's playing and two kills and it's a one level difference that it's it's not a comeback mechanic anymore it's a slingshot mechanic especially if you've already said how it it, it plays out you kind of turtle you wait death timers get longer there's gold and tier two towers especially on the side and all of a sudden the comeback if you like you know are able to like wipe the team it's not like okay cool we have to do that one more time it might be like wow now we're in the lead because of all the gold and all the experience that's on the map with the objective uh bounties and whatnot all these things just erase individual player differences and domination as well because so many of these mechanics um can benefit like they're they're kind of either global in the case of 
objective bounties, or it's whoever happens to get the last hit, which could catapult a, a player who doesn't deserve that extra gold or hasn't been playing well enough to get that extra gold, suddenly catapults them ahead of their of their rival within the game who's playing much better, which is, it is fucking lame, guys. Like, I don't understand why bad players should get their their dominance removed from the game or get arbitrarily and randomly rewarded for not having good games. Look, there's already, look, when if you've been killed three times in a row by somebody, four times in a row, something like that, and you finally kill them, there's already a huge amount of evenness that, that comes from just the fact that you get like their, their personal bounty, but if you're lower in level, you get more experience for killing somebody that's higher level. Then like as the game progresses, death timers become longer. So that's longer that you can farm, like take camps, take an objective. Like there's already enough. Like you don't need to win one team fight and suddenly you get three objective bounties and you get like 1000 gold just for killing the champion. And you get like the turret gold that you get from, from killing the objective anyway. And you get to like farm all the way. It's like, what the fuck is this man? Like it, there's no way that it should be. I outplay you three times. You outplay me once. And then suddenly we're even because of that, because you did the final outplay. Like that's, that's not how it should work. I agree. I think we're all on the same page there. And the answer is, there are a lot of bad players in the player base of League of Legends. Maybe we get like a uh, a super set of rules that take away some of those things for pro play or something. They'll never uh, do that, though. I know, but I mean, one one can dream. It, it is it is something that has I mean, been done the in same other things about about champion balance, right? Like the reason why they don't do a pro patch and uh, like you know a, a like a public server patch is because they want everyone to be playing the same game at all points. So they will never actually differentiate it. So they're doing this thing where like, I mean, I feel like part of the reason why they added these objective bounties and all these comeback mechanics to the game was because people in League of Legends and solo queue have generally weak mentals. And when they get behind, they just want to forfeit and just get the yep. fuck out of the game. Oh, and there's like a lot of negativity and a lot of toxicity within that. And they're trying to make players that are in really losing games feel like, oh, we can still win. Look, the fucking dragon is yellow. It's got an objective bounty. If we win and we get that dragon, maybe we could come back and win the game. Like that is what they're trying to do. They're trying to like, because League of Legends players are so mentally ill, they're trying to compensate for their mental illness by adding like little like dopamine hits into the game, <laughs> like artificially. That's what's, that's what's being, uh, well, that's what's happening in the game right now. And there's, yeah. and, 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 and the pros have to pay for it for now. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to see uh, Nidalee sometime again soon. <laughs> Look at the, well, the thing is, is that it just limits the amount of styles of compositions that can be successfully selected, right? Without there were already massive risks to running the kind of composition that Don Juan played. But the mm -hmm. the argument was, if you played it well enough in the early game, you should be able to win that game even with a few mistakes. And that's just not what happened. Um, and I think. Like I said, this is the this is the bleached skeleton warning to the rest of the world that in a very high level game of League of Legends, that this is somehow fucking possible uh, and is a warning to everyone from this point forward to not do this. Scale, baby. <laughs> uh, Look, it's not just that these champions were strong. The reason we saw Victor versus Corky for the entire season so far, and we've seen Jinx versus Aphilios. For the entire fucking season. Yep. It was just rarely this obvious. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, that brings us to our final match. One that we've been sitting on for a very long time here in uh, the LCK. The one that we've been waiting for. T1 Gen G. Uh, this is it. Church Chovy against the GOAT. What, what, do, what do we think here, Monty? I think it's hard to imagine T1 losing this one. Uh, I think the teams play quite differently than each other. Uh, so there is the possibility that we we might see a game or two win from Gen G, especially since their early game focus is quite different with T1 having much more of an emphasis on Herald and Gen G having a much more uh, like a much larger emphasis um, on the dragon. I think Gen G in this series against Don Juan Kia, we saw this mini meta erupt where Ezreal Karma became quite popular um, and kind of went up the draft priority as the series went on. I think that running those picks when you are trying to control Dragon and force an early bot side advantage from Genji might be a way to 
force dragon fights at like force, you know, a soul win condition relatively early in the game that could result in a Gen G win. Um, but I think it's it's hard to imagine Gen G winning the finals in their current state. I think T1 really is excellent at playing the kind of long range pick compositions that they have more or less perfected over the last few weeks. And their execution on these compositions is extremely good. And it's also very difficult, if not impossible, to ban them from using them because they can do it in so many different ways. And they've kind of mastered the gymnastics of being able to assemble these drafts where all of the pieces that they want in terms of poke and resets and, and everything um, can be fanned out across the lanes in different ways. And they have so much practice on these comps that it does seem hard to beat them. I mean, here's my question. Do you think that Genji wins the game? I think Genji will win one game. I'm, I'm thinking T1's going to 3-0. It's possible. possible. I would say 3-0 and 3-1 are the most possible, like probable outcomes to yeah. in T1's favor. I think Genji will be able to pull a game. Just yeah, I mean, off I think of they can. sheer I, greatness. I sure. Like, I, mean, uh, they could, I mean, they also just always have game Like, they... Feels like generally there's like a game. It's like it's like game four of the Dom Juan series where like Chovy will just play one of his champions, not get punished, scale out of this world. He'll just be too fucking far ahead, which is why I feel like he's so popular is because when he has a game like that, it just looks like, holy shit, this guy is so much stronger than anyone else would be at this point. Um, but it's just like when you look at this team, when you look at Gen G, I I feel like top lane is irrelevant for them pretty much. I think Peanut yep. is always somebody who plays poorly in big games. Like you saw it even in the Dom Juan series. I think Canyon was that his Nocturne game was fucking horrible. Like people, I mean, people so. will knock him. Like people will knock him for that. You know, the how he just got completely destroyed in the jungle. But that was also a factor of the team's picks and like the full press that was going on in the lanes. Um, you know, the fact that the Nidalee it did choose to invade early on when all the lanes were pushed up and like continuously press that advantage. So it wasn't like all peanuts. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but the nocturne game, just some of the mistakes were just so egregious, like him dying early on recalling in the enemy jungler on top of a ward was you just, you can't do this. Like that game really snowballed out of control because peanut died. And then Kenya went top and then mega snowballed the Camille and top lane with that advantage. And that's just a stupid mistake. And you can't do that in a final. I mean, he did, he did, he did. I mean, the game five was a stupid mistake in terms of pathing. Like, you know, you're playing sure. against an Italy and Italy, it, like, you know what the win con of Italy is. If, if you end up getting through a clear and Italy ends up getting through a clear, like at the same time, you have won the game. Nice. Congratulations. Like <laughs> it's already over. Like, obviously yeah. it's not that simple, but it essentially feels like you're massively ahead if you're ever even. So the way that he passed, like he just wasn't aware of Nidalee clear timer and he didn't know like what he could do. He thought that he could sneak out an extra camp or like he could not full clear his bot side um, and go into top and it just didn't work. So, I mean, I feel like this is just, these are the mistakes that he makes. He makes these like, just like pathing errors and versus a good team. I mean, they, they normally punish. So for me, I mean, I think Chovy is obviously the hope. Like always, um, I think Ruler actually had a pretty good series, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that. I think Ruler um, and Lehens actually played pretty well. But overall, uh, it just looks like, it, it seems to me like T1's just going to have an advantage everywhere. So, yeah, I mean, I could see 3-1, um, but I don't even, like, even if it's a 3-1, I don't think it's going to be a close 3-1. No, uh, I don't know I, if, like... I don't think so either. <laughs> which is something that seems weird to say, but, like, for example, an exam for, for example, to me, a not close 3-1 is, like, the Rogue series. The Rogue versus Misfit series. It was a 3-1, but that to me, it might as well be a I fucking 3-0. Because it didn't Rogue feel like they could Rogue actually kind of ever lose. that third game. So. Exactly. Like, maybe T1 could have a game like that. You know, where it's like, ah, they just played fucking bad. They just, like, did some... They, they like, went for, like, a stupid play. It got out of control. You know, they go for a dive with Faker or something. Chovy ends up super I high mean, in CS and he carries the game. It, it is worth noting the number of times that I have seen Faker in a final in the third game where he picks something super weird and then completely shits on the other person with it. And then they win 3-0 anyway, even though like, it yeah. seems like there's an opportunity. <laughs> like that's for, the game. It's like, the, here's here comes the troll game. Oh, it doesn't matter because he's just too good. Yeah. Yeah. Which is different than Larson when he picks like the Kaisen game three. It's like, okay, that <laughs> oh, was the oops. troll game. Please <laughs> never pick that again. Play your fucking mages, please. Like, you play Lucian. We'll, gi we'll give you Lucian. We'll consider <laughs> that a mage Lucian. for this. But please, please no Kaisen, man. Please no Kaisen. Yeah. 
next game right back onto uh, Oriana Larson and the rest of Rogue uh, take care of business against Misfits and they move on three to one in that series. Lucian, very uh, impressive there. They were using the uh, the J4 Rumble combo to perfection in game number one against Misfits. In game number two, uh, that was picking on uh, Hirit, right? It was just going top and just making sure Camille wasn't a champion and Odawamne kind of uh, uh, getting big on that one. Game three, a little bit of a troll, as we've said. And then in game four, uh, where we close it out, that was just a uh, comp difference with comp on the Zeri just uh, popping off. What did you guys see in that one there, Monty? I saw Shlatan and Mursa having giant nerves and a completely mm. choke. And and look, the, going into this, like something I, I, something I said on the best damn league show is like the only way that Misfits could win is if Hirat massively steps up. He needs to actually be competent because the the shit that he was doing in regular season where he's just like getting solo killed all the time, like he's he's the type of guy that he's solo killing himself. Like he's not getting outplayed by the enemy where he's doing intelligent things and the enemy is just better. Like he puts himself in situations where it's just like he 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 is dying if the enemy just recognizes that he's inting. And we saw that in game one. That was like the first death. Like, sure, he did get pressured off the turret, but then he just walks back into the Ignite Rumble and just gets solo killed. And it's like, all right, well, now, like, top is is gone from, like, oh, you're going to be 10 CS behind to, like, you are getting fucking fisted by Odo Omne. So, <laughs> I don't know. The The problem here is, is just that here it had an awful series. He's had a pretty awful split. And when you look at how Rogue prepped, they just did what everyone could expect. Ban the Schlotten Lee Sin. Okay, then Schlotten is much worse too. You win the game. Like three players on Misfits are not playing well. Vedio played a little bit under his performance, but even if he played like a god, they're still losing the series every time. Like they're just way outclassed if here at Schlotten and Mercer are all liabilities. Yep. Uh, I, I think too that people have to remember that if you were a rookie during the pandemic, even players who played last year have extremely limited stage time uh, because almost all of the, the games in LEC for the last couple of years have been played online. And so even being on stage is a different experience for them, right? And then being on stage in a high pressure matches and is, is uh, a different experience. You have to remember many of the new players over the last couple of years have literally never played in front of fans. Mm. So uh, they don't, they haven't had a smooth, like, ramp into high pressure environments. And so I think that as a result of that, we will probably see underperformances from a lot of new players uh, that are you know unique to the situation that has developed as a result of them having to play the vast majority of their professional career online. Yeah. Also, like oh, I like that. I like forgot Misfits. about that. It, it felt like Misfits was uh, just not picking to, to like what the situation was. Right, like if your top laner is getting completely shit on, and the enemy is like early drafting Aphilios and Jace, just pick Malphite. I know people aren't gonna realize this as a super valid criticism because he did play fine in that game three with Camille, but game two could have also just been a Malphite game. Jace Aphilios, why are we going with with the skill champion, the Camille, when you're massively outclassed top lane? Like you're lucky that this wasn't a three zero, and if it wasn't for Larson picking Kaisa, it probably was, right? So, it, to well, me, one the thing, problem is... One thing Odo Abne said on Summoning Insight last week about top lane in Europe was that he felt that none of the, the European teams were actually playing through top lane and enabling top lane carries to that point in time. Uh, and he thought that was a very different pace than what many of the other regions in the world were doing and many of the top teams in the world were doing. And I think you saw that shift from Rogue within this series for sure. What, what he discussed. Um, and I think perhaps one of the other issues was that the Misfits may not have been anticipating that level of an attention to top lane from the rest of Rogue. Yeah, because normally like when like here it dies before the jungler's there, so they don't even know that the jungler actually was there. He's just getting solo <laughs> killed while the jungler is like on wolves. He's like, I'm pathing. Oh, never mind. Okay, it's a solo kill. Okay, I guess we'll go take dragon. So it's really shocking. Here it has been much jungler... worse this year than last year. Yeah, he's been really fucking bad. He's been really fucking bad this year. I mean, well, I, I would love to see somebody should should post this in the comments. How many times has Hirat been solo killed this year? 
it's got to be most in 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 uh lec right like i don't think that there's anyone that's got solo killed as much as here it he's got to be up there for being solo killed um the most so i would love to see if that's actually true if he is the most solo killed player in all of lec this year i try to do a quick search in the places i i go to it is not on there so yeah let us know in the comments below and make sure you yeah. subscribe while on the way. Since we're hitting LEC for the first time in a while, and we're going to be hitting it for uh, at least two more weeks. Um, that was our first series on the top of the winner's bracket. Then we had our second series, El uh, European Classico, uh, with G2 and Fnatic. Uh, I guess not the original uh, Classico. That was Fnatic and SK. Is that right, Monty? I believe it was like the first Fnatic. one where people... Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I guess the Battle of the Kings. It was the the Peke versus Ocelot days. Uh, yeah, I was thinking. I always f personally liked the uh, the Gambit versus Fnatic more. I always felt more classic to me <laughs> because I felt like Gambit, you know, was. I think technically the first the one was Europe. M5 versus CLG. I think that's that's the yeah. first classico. That's because all those guys were just lovable bullies darian was just like i don't care i'm gonna die 50 well, times styles I'm... were entirely yeah. different so it was like mm -hmm. actually super compelling to watch those games uh because it was such a weird matchup and he got a rule changed in league of legends uh in competitive play around the world which is um that you cannot build intentionally like completely grief items when you're ahead to disrespect your opponents he used to build death cap on renekton in like almost every game because he would just have like 4k gold leads <laughs> and he would just put a, a death cap on his champion and and eventually like i remember because i was a i was an lcs player at that point we actually got you know the riot act read to us by riot themselves um yeah they told us what was the logic hey, behind that if you want to squander your money like yeah what yeah i mean it was just Me because like, would be okay with that that was the rule. It's like you cannot buy intentionally troll items. Like you can buy items that are like, you know, like you could buy a support item on jungle or something that could make sense. But if you have like no AP ratios, um, going like they didn't want to see like death cap Renekton and stuff specifically. They didn't want to see death cap on Warwick at the time um, when it was never being built because they thought that it uh, lowered the the illusion of competition to the uh, to the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they don't know how to build stars like you know the fact that you still remember the death cap redactin made it so that it was part of this player's like star power and identity so in fact they were just sabotaging themselves yeah. at the end but it's like what else does like riot do really yeah it's like it's like if uh in the nba they were like you cannot do like highlight dunks when you're on a fast <laughs> break like you can't do it between the legs dunk like you have to do the most efficient dunk possible in the situation two hands <laughs> Over your head, <laughs> through the basket. <laughs> but NBA, they, they, might miss, they might miss it if they try to do behind the back. No, 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 no. That's basically it. <laughs> and they do miss it sometimes, but it's yep. like still worth it. It's like, it's still okay. And so, you know? Then you would talk about it. Do you remember when Dilly was so far ahead, he built Death Cap and then they lost in game five? Like that would, yep. that would be a moment. Yep. Uh, yep. Well, as, as, a, as is most things in League of Legends esports, it has survived in spite of Riot, but not because of them. <laughs> uh, well, uh, one team that did survive the top side of the bracket was G2, who uh, were unable to uh, get over the hump of Fnatic, as that is, with Fnatic uh, going 3-1 here. They, it was 1-1 for uh, after 2, but then uh, Fnatic pull ahead. Uh, what stood out to us from that one other than the caps had i remember a ridiculous prediction charm i think it was on upset on the bottom on the bottom mm -hmm. side of the map with like caps it was, was a lot of fun to watch series. it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't game winning but he he made a lot of highlight plays also the lissandra uh came out in game number one for uh g2 uh but what 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 are your what are your thoughts here dom we'll go with you first um so yeah i mean i thought the renata viego combo pretty interesting uh you know, Razor looked like he was in better form in general. I know he had the, the 0 6 uh, Viego game in game two, but that was really just Hilly running it down. That was, I don't know what the fuck Hilly was doing that game. Like, normally I can yeah. kind of vibe with Hilly, like when he's going for some like int plays. I'm like, I'm like, I can see how that's worth it. Like, you suicided at level one, but you canceled a recall and got a flash. So maybe you can punish that in the next five minutes. There was, 
Like I was just watching Haley just run it down where I'm like, yeah, this is a that protest. Maybe he just doesn't want to play uh, Nautilus or something. So <laughs> yeah, he, he definitely had had some some pretty fucking in deaths. I think game three from Hilly was really good. Or game one was really good. The Zillion performance is really good, but he did run it down in lane once where he just like double bombed on Zillion and then he just walked in and just started beating some ass, just auto attacking on Zillion. I'm like, wait, hold on, Hilly. Like, can you <laughs> actually just auto clocks, attack man. like that? And then he just gets one shot. It's like, mm, all right, okay. I mean, I guess this is going to be a little bit of a scary game, but you know, I think Fnatic just looked like the, the overall better team. Uh, I was surprised actually in the community from how, uh, how many people actually believe that G2 is going to win this. Uh, just talking what? to like players. Yeah, talking to players. Um, apparently, there, there, so there's a narrative also like that was started by Perks where he discussed how bad Fnatic is in scrims. Like they're fucking running it down every scrim. And he said something like, if, you know, Fnatic wins the split, it just shows how fucking useless scrims are. I think people have really got behind that. People are like, damn, Fnatic's running it down. They can't do well uh, in, in competitive. But I mean, I feel like they look the same, right? Like they still look like a team. Like if, if I didn't hear that, I would feel the same way that I did one week ago or three weeks ago, whenever the split ended um, and still think the Fnatic's the favorite to win. So uh, I feel like all the players are playing in better form individually. And the only person that I think had like a wavering performance was Hillisong in the series. But it's like, I feel like Hillisong always has those games and you always trust that he's going to perform in the big ones. So to me, it didn't bother me. I I'm completely on board with how uh, Fnatic played. I think they're still looking like they're poised to win. I mean, I think Hillisong will win you two games for every one that he ints. So I'm not ultra concerned so that means that he's okay so he entered two games already which means that's that they're guaranteed to win at least two games versus rogue because of hill song <laughs> he's got two in the bank so I, I i think like yes he did in fact entirely ruin game two as dom says but i think the problem with g2 is that so one of the nice things about g2 i will say is that they actually were playing through top lane more than most of the other european teams prior to the start of playoffs which i think gave them a pretty nice setup to potentially have some broken blade carry performances but if you're gonna do well in playoffs you have to have like one other lane that's that's doing okay or like is capable of carrying and I think Caps's performances have to be more than mediocre in order for that to occur. And if you're trying to play more supportive or CC oriented mid laners, then Flacket has to step up. Like somebody has to do the damage. Somebody has to be the 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 hyper carry, especially if you're going to pick scalers into the late game. And we didn't see that. So I'm just not sure this iteration of G2 really has the star power or the form right now to overcome Rogue or Fnatic. Like they're good enough and they're they I think they're good enough in this meta to be the third best team in Europe, depending on how Vitality does, obviously. But moving beyond that, I think is is going to be difficult. I don't know why I'm feeling like Vitality is going to beat them. I think Vitality is, is going to make a, a little bit of a run here. So I, I, I definitely think I, I was I would have been highly skeptical of that statement before I saw game five, which was one of the better Vitality games I've seen this year. And it may, perhaps gave me false hope. Perhaps it was a random occurrence that they managed to play an early game well and like play to a win condition and play around the <laughs> lanes properly. But it, it did happen. So I am now forced to speculate that it could be possible in future best of fives. Yeah, I think the problem with G2 is like they don't they don't convince me that they're a good team when they're ahead. Like and I feel like that's really dangerous for a player like Perks. Um, in general, it seems like he's just going to like find the times where people are just inting. Um, I mean, you saw it in game four, right? Like that in, in game four of the vitality series, people wonder, it's like people that have watched and have watched a lot of European league of legends. And even last year with C9, people will always be like, why do people like perks? Like he looks just like, he's like slightly above average mid laner. Like most people would have him what, like fourth or fifth in, in Europe, this split. Um, and it's because he's like, you can tell that when shit hits the fan, and most teams have that moment. Where it's like, oh shit, like, are we going to just collapse or are we going to push through? He's always the one that like will make the play that will completely change the dynamic of the series. And I mean, I saw that in game four from him. Um, I mean, when we talk about the, the vitality XL, so I don't know. We'll see. I think the thing about G2 to stick to that point is that when they have leads, it feels like they don't really know what to do. Like they kind of know what to do. They'll like get to the objective and they'll be ready. But for some reason, it always goes bad. Um, and I think that that's a quality that you just can't have if you're ever going to win Europe, uh, because you're not going to just 
shit on people so fucking hard early game when there's this much talent left in the tournament um, that you're going to be able to have massive leads in those situations where the leads are going to um, carry themselves, like where you don't actually have to outthink people um, in those situations. So I, I still have not seen them like execute late game situations from relatively like even gold leads. And I just think that eventually that'll bite them in the ass. Maybe they will be vitality. I mean, vitality is not a very good team. I don't know. That's not what I'm saying. I just think that like eventually it'll get to the point where, you know, they're going to have to work yeah. on some of the the things that they, they fail at. It's kind of like hundred thieves in NA where it's like, until you actually can show proper play around objectives, I can never really believe in you. Look, yeah, I think I think it's we can even simplify it further, which is as follows. Uh, where would you rank all of the G2 players individually compared to the other players in the playoffs? You know what I mean? Like Caps is, I would say, generously fourth. And it depends on whether you value Perks', Perks clutch factor uh, more than you val value like you know, Perks, as you say, you would rate him as the fourth or fifth best mid laner, but does his clutch factor move him up those rankings, right? Because you would certainly say that VTO, Larson, Humanoid are better than than yeah. Caps in his current or form. Play okay? better, yeah. Definitely. So uh, who are the other players that we're talking about here? Where is Flacket in all of this? Like Flacket and Targamas have to be a massive underdog to upset in Hillisang, which has consistently been the best bot lane mm -hmm. in Europe. Yep. I think that... Uh, they're worse than many of the other bot lanes or on par at the very least, like in a matchup where we see Karzi, Lebrov versus Flacket and Targamas. Are we are we really sure that Flacket and Targamas is the better bot lane duo? Like, seems I, I, I think they're better, but it's like, I don't even think they're better by enough. Yeah, exactly. They're not a lot better. They're, that's the problem is that <laughs> they're not better enough where I'm like, G2 is going to smash bot lane. I think top lane could go either way. You know, like I could see Alfari outplaying Broken Blade in the series. I could see Broken Blade playing Alfari and uh, outplaying Alfari sure. in the series. Their, their strongest players are Yankos and Broken Blade right now. Definitely. Yankos, I think Yankos is probably the number two. I think you can make an argument for number one. Uh, I think he's Jungler. the best. Person. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but outside of that, if you're talking about having one player at potentially... The, the, as being the top player in their position on your team, it's I think it's hard to win a title doing that unless you are more than the sum of your parts and you have exceptional teamwork and G2 Which does is, not have that. Yeah, well, they're they're actually less than the sum of their parts. <laughs> I, I <would> say. Like, <laughs> so if they're less than the sum of their parts and, and their the parts, parts aren't even, even good. and their parts are like <laughs> third, fourth on average in the league, you're going to have a bad fucking time when it comes to playoffs. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, like, whoever wins the Vitality G2 series is probably just going to beat Misfits. I think Misfits are just not equipped to to deal with playoffs. I think that they're out of their depth at this point. Yep. I completely but agree. I can't see any of these three teams um, beating Fnatic or Rogue. Yeah. So. Yeah, when you speak about the exact matchup that they don't want, it feels like it's this one. It's this one here. So uh, G2 have their work cut out for him uh who do you got in that matchup well i think i think maybe there is there there is potentially a world where j2 can exploit some of the early game deficiencies that vitality has which as far as i can tell is the players like don't even communicate any information about the game to each other uh and then they just wait for team fights to happen and then they kind of play well in those and hope that they can come back or catch a throw from the enemy team uh i don't think g2 is going to be good enough in the early game to really exploit that so i think it's pretty 50 50 honestly um and as for you know as for vitality even if they win this coming up against a team that has significantly tighter early game plays in, in rogue or fanatic is going to be a nightmare for them yeah yeah what you got you want to talk about xl versus vitality i was gonna skip by it but we we, we can i uh xl yeah, i think that was the best series two games to close it out uh, and, and kind of make their playoff debut a, a dream run here. And again, a very, very, very different kind of conversation we'd have about Vitality, about the super team, about them, you know, what their expectations should be. But uh, two games they're not able to close out. And as you said, on game number five, one of the few games where Vitality looked the part and could play early game and were playing with comms on and, and, and getting leads here, uh, Monty. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what 
XL was doing. Uh, I, I don't know why you abandoned the Jinx pick that I think was working pretty well <laughs> for them over the course of the series and pick Caitlyn instead. Caitlyn has gone down in priority globally uh, for, I think, a lot of the reasons that you see in this game, which is that it, it's trans... Look, uh, let, me, let me play devil's advocate. I think they wanted to do this because Mickey has been a very good Lux player and you have the possibility of a Caitlyn Lux with Mickey carrying the shit out of this game. That was a possibility that was on the table that existed. Uh, however, I don't think it's worth the risk when we see self-made playing very well around that lane, kind of forcing them back by repeated invades into the bot side jungle so they're not able to press an advantage. And then the scaling is just worse for, for Caitlyn than it is for Jinx in, in the late game where they would have had a chance to come back. Also, uh, Mordekaiser pick interesting for sure uh when you get set behind early on against that camille very difficult to deal with that situation and so didn't do whatever excel was hoping it was going to do in terms of eliminating one of the players from team fights or being able to split push this game yep i think game five was weird i, I was surprised that vitality didn't ban jinx because when i'm looking at the series like i feel like the main way that XL would end up winning the series is if Jinx was uh, available um, throughout it. Like if Patrick just carries, I think that's yep. probably the way that you lose. Like your bot lane has been the liability if you're Vitality the entire split. Um, Karzi has just not had a good split. And I think that actually if you ban the Jinx and you get into like the, the next tier of 80 carries that are popping up right now, like the Kaisas and the Ashes and those types of um, Zaya, those types of champions, MF Ezreal, now. yeah. Zaya, Ezreal, like, I feel like these are champions that Karzi is actually better at historically than these, like, long-range, super-positioning focused. Um, I mean, he's been traditionally been a terrible Aphelios player. Like, if we look at the, the scope of his career, he's been better this year, but his Aphelios win record was, like, 30% prior to coming into this year, and his Ezreal win record was very good. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's just, like, one of those 80 carries that, you know, needs, uh, needs an escape every now and then with how he positions. Like, he's just one of the... <laughs> It looks like when Degon's playing AD carry, you know, it's like, Degon, please stop playing Varus, man. Please, just like, please just lock in Ezreal. So I thought, thought we were going to go with tactical here, but yeah, we could use me. T that tactical could take a break for once. I think uh, tactical might be slightly better than you. I'm not sure, though. I'd have to watch more of your stream, to be honest. <laughs> to be sure about that one. But, I mean, right. if we're going to talk about positives for Vitality here, just going to quickly move past the flame. Uh <laughs> I mean, I would say that, like, if you're looking for a moment where you're like, okay, so why do people like perks? Just look at game four. Vitality throw the shit out of the game. Suddenly, enemy team has Baron, and what happens? Perks gets packaged, packages into the whole enemy team, and they just win instantly there. And it's like, okay, well, I guess the game's just over. Um, so it, it's just, like, one of those things where it feels like he always has those moments. And uh, I think that perks is really valuable to have in a series when the teams are close to evenly matched. Um, I think at this point in his career, there are people that just purely outmatch him. Um, I, I think Humanoid right now is just a better player. Um, but I think that there's like extra value uh, in, in what Perks brings. That's why I'd probably never predict Vitality to beat Fnatic. But I mean, I could I could see them beating everyone else besides for probably Rogue. But if I were to say, who do I think Vitality matches up better against? I would say uh, Rogue there as well. So yeah, Bob, do you want to do you want to? Place a bet on when Perks changes to support to end his career. <laughs> I, think I think it's, it's I think it's, it's definitely pro possible. I don't think he does. I don't think he does. I, he I literally don't, I don't think he does. He's too much he, ego. You know? No, he abandoned mid lane, the most impactful role in League of Legends, to to bring Caps onto the roster. Now he did take it back later. That's fair. He did he did mm -hmm. try and reclaim it, uh, and then he went to Cloud Nine after that. But. Overall, I think it's not implausible that Perks switches to support sometime in the future. I don't think he'll do it. I mean, uh, look, he couldn't even handle playing AD and being like, I don't even have, like, I'm, I'm not strong enough in the game. You know, I need to be mid lane strong. Like, he couldn't even handle that. He's like, I, I will go to fucking NA before I play another split of, NA, of AD. So I think he's just here. <laughs> on mid to stay and honestly i feel like this is actually one of the better regular seasons that he's had like if you compare this split compared to summer split in na i thought that this was much better so to me i'm like i wasn't expecting perks to be the best mid in in eu that's not like that was never my take i expected to be like pretty much where he is fourth fifth but then like he's somebody who you want to have on your team um i'm more disappointed overall in vitality and like the other members i mean lebrov does lebrov is the razor cake to me 
on this team where every time I look at his fucking solo queue, I am like, this guy is too high rated. He must be insane. He must just end up being the best. I think before this, he was like 1900 LP, like rank one by like 300 over the next person. And I'm one of those people that I don't put too much into it, but I definitely value it to some degree. Like if you're really popping off in, in solo queue, normally you're like at least confident in yourself, but then you watch him in game and he looks super unconfident every single time. So I don't know. I don't know what to, to, to think about that. I think when you look at G2 versus Vitality, it could be interesting. Um, but mainly because I feel like when when you look at like the matchups overall, I feel like both teams match up evenly. Like both of their bot lanes are probably the weakest part. Um, I would give I would give Vitality a slight mid lane advantage right now. I'd give G2 a slight jungle advantage. And then I think both top laners are really insane um in general i think bb's played better this split but i think alfari's landing is something um that you know is special and a lot of the time like a player like bb relies on getting advantages in lane uh and if you ban out certain champions i wonder if he'll be able to do that versus alfari so i think this is actually going to be a really good series it sounds like you think it's going to be relatively vitality favored from from that rundown yeah 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 i do i do and I also, I mean, I also like from watching them play against each other, it's like, what happens if you don't have the Trindamir into GP just getting completely shit on in that second game? Like first time I thought Vitality looked pretty good. Like they kind of stomped them. Second game, they got stomped, but I don't know. I don't know why I have a feeling like Vitality is actually going to uh, pull it out here. I mean, I think it's fair because we know this roster should be capable of deep playoff runs just based on the star power that it contains. It's just a matter of were they going to actually live up to that potential and that threat will always remain. I'm sure the rest of the bracket isn't super happy that Excel didn't close out this series because if, is there, if there was going to be a surprise dark horse, it was going to be this vitality roster. They have the pieces to make to win. Like you wouldn't say about really any of the other teams outside of Fnatic and Rogue. I believe that player for player, they have the star power to win. Vitality does. They've just been shitty as a team. Yeah. And I, mean, I think that Selfmade stepped up uh, in this last series that they played. And I think that he was one of the, the people that I expected more from in general. I mean, the thing about Vitality, the reason why they're still not a good team is you still don't see the interaction between Lebrov and Selfmade like intentionally. Sometimes they'll they end have, up in the same place. They have place. like anti-synergy. They're like two magnets that you can't like push together. Yeah, I mean, I think the weird thing about them is like, even when they do stuff together, I never feel like it, like, I'm just like, did this happen by chance? Like, were they just like in the same location at the same time? Like, like, because they don't, I feel like they don't plan anything together. There's never like a, all right, like, what are you planning on doing? Oh, okay. I can see that plan. I'm going to help you do this. I don't see that. So I don't know. I was going to say this run reminiscent of the, uh, Sixth place TSM runs. We'll see what happens. They always have the star power. You always wanted to see TSM out of the playoffs early on in uh tournament. What was that the two 2020 summer playoffs? No, I thought they did it before like like in uh 2014. Oh, yeah. we're going way back. Okay. Yeah, yeah, way back, way back. 20 2014. Yeah, summer playoffs. It was that that got them to worlds. To be fair, over... they also made a roster change for Lust Boy for Glebe Glarbu, which probably was the biggest contributing factor. If I had to, if I had to get yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always got to get a uh, reference in there every now and then. Uh, <laughs> all right, LEC done and dusted. One more to one major reason to go here with the uh, LPL uh, LPL playoffs kicked off here. Uh, and uh dom i think in our last episode we hadn't figured out which teams were in the playoffs we still had the the couple of playing games whether it was going to be uh rare adam in or was it uh oh my god was going to be in yeah and eventually pans out rare adams in okay cool start the playoffs because this gauntlet is a very 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 long gauntlet what did we miss out on uh so i think you got expected results so far um edg took care of business uh in in their first series uh then you had the uh ts versus uh blg series today ts ended up winning that which i think would be surprising to people before the season but if you've been following blg and you've been seeing the trajectory of ts ts has been doing a lot better recently um they started like two and four um i think they only lost i think they ended up like 10 and six or maybe 11 and five or something 
Uh, so they they definitely leveled up when they made their roster change. And then you had BLG take care of business in their first round as well. So I, I think you're getting all expected results. I mean, the higher seed is just one every single time. There's actually a banger coming up uh, tomorrow. I mean, this is being filmed on, a, on filmed on a Monday. So on a, on Tuesday, there is the uh, Weibo versus EDG series, which I think is really interesting because Weibo was at the, the absolute top. And then EDG, obviously, I mean, everyone knows about them, right? World champions, same roster. Uh, feels like they're starting to get more into their form. They're, they're bot lane not winning as hard as they were previously. I mean, Mako is having a pretty bad split. Um, but that being said, it seems like Scout has got into form and they're starting to develop that style again of roaming mid and making plays with the jungler, which is when they look like they're at their best. So uh, if I were to do a pick right now, I would probably say I, I think EDG will win that, especially based on, you know, the, the, the players that they have. It feels like Weibo always slightly disappoints you. Um, at least... That's how I felt the whole last year. So, yeah, uh, that's pretty much what we've we've had so far. Nothing's been unexpected yet, but we've had, yeah, already three best of fives in playoffs. So that means we got 10 more coming up. And I'm not caught up on LPL yet, but I will be by next week. So I'm not going to issue my unfounded. You're going to have you're going to have a lot of games to watch because <laughs> the schedule is crazy for LPL. For those that don't know. Uh, we started playoffs on uh, Saturday, and it's just been Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, like Thursday. Yeah. And I think there's one day break, maybe Friday or Saturday. So there's one day break in there, and then it just keeps on going again. So Well, well, Dom, I won't have LCS Super Week, and I also won't have the four best of fives between LCK to watch. So it actually should be much more manageable uh, than this past okay. week. I mean, you All were right. what? You were? I saw you were streaming for like 14 hours yesterday. Uh, yeah. well, would you do yeah, LPL like, into LEC into LCS? That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was tough to be honest. Yeah. Like the, the <laughs> problem is the sleeping, right? Because especially when there's tie breaks and stuff, it's like you get to sleep at like nine, 10 PM my time and LPL starts at three 45. So right. <laughs> like, and no one is falling. It's not like the stream. I turn off, I press stop streaming and I instantly just pass out right there. And I just like, I, I, I'm actually, when there. did you, when did you actually have time to watch the Dom Juan Gen G match? Cause that was a full five map series that happened during your stream. Yeah, in between. So I can watch matches obviously a lot, a lot faster. Sure. Um, like when, that's why when I watch bugs. mods too. Cause I just sit there and yeah, play yeah, with yeah. YouTube. So you I know, watched keys. it. <laughs> I, took, I took a break in between LPL and LEC. Like there's like a two and a half hour, three hour break. Uh, and I just watched all the time. games there. Yeah. 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 And like, 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 I mean, I, I'm, I didn't watch every single second of the Dom one. No. Like for example, game necessary. four. <laughs> yeah. Game four. Once, like once the game is over, I just go to the next game. You know, I look at draft yes. and then we, we see yep. game five. So yep. actually game five, I watched live because uh, LPL ended like a little bit earlier that day because there was only four games at LPL oh, and there was five games. It. Yeah, so like I, I got to watch uh, the 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 fifth game first and then I went back and I watched the four games. But then also while I was doing LPL in between games, I was also like I had LCK on the second monitor. So I was like able to like check in with how the series was going. So I mean, yeah, it's just <laughs> a lot of league. <laughs> watched a lot of hey, fucking this, league, bro. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> this was, this I think was the craziest weekend of, of league yeah. that I've, I mean, it was, between it was this LCS Super Week, it was three. How many best of fives in LPL? Three best of four best of fives. Uh, th three there was, best of fives. There was three, three best, best of fives, fives that went four games each. Yep. Yeah, and then best of fives in three best of fives in LEC, and then best yep. of fives in LCK. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it was actually not possible to watch it all live because they were scheduled on top of each other, and yeah. you know, catching up with these games was was quite quite the quite the difficult task but this yeah. is all needless to say that now that the hell is over it will be a lot easier to catch up on lpl this next week yeah yep yeah again for our friend uh friends that have stuck with us throughout or maybe you're skipping to this point here uh big big props to uh dom and monty for watching every single game uh, uh almost every LPL single game <laughs> almost every <laughs> single game so i'm sorry dom for <laughs> streaming every single game because <laughs> me watching them alone when i can just skip around and you know do it quickly in my own brain is a lot different than having to react and explain to people on stream, which is much more grueling. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right. And the pause, like the in between games and LCS. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. It's like 20 <laughs> minutes of like, and the thing is like, 
like it's really easy like when you're like three four hours in the stream it's like oh i'm just gonna like watch a video real quick or answer some questions or do this or like shout out but then when you're like 13 14 hours in it's like you just want to like sit there in silence until the next game of league like you don't really <laughs> want to be talking for that amount of time but you know whatever we're, we're we're used to it it's not it's not the hardest job in the world watching league so i think i can i can make it through god bless you dom god bless you <laughs> uh Thanks. so to wrap up here lpl three more series coming up before we get to the double elimination bracket portion that will start friday morning for those of us in uh the west coast or i guess you know friday day for everyone else uh eastern afterwards and european and european eastern and european uh, yeah anyone going east of california that that is how our la my la brain works now uh yeah. we're the center <laughs> my bad uh all right damn that was a lot again a lot of league that we went through but it it's it's uh setting up everything important so big matches coming up here uh obviously the lck finals coming up uh saturday at two which is at the same time we finally get to see the full strength rosters of t1 and well knock on wood i should say yeah, we finally, yeah. <laughs> hopefully get to see the full strength rosters of t1 and Gen G going up against each other which is probably going to be less exciting than we would like but it's still exciting yeah, like this is these are the times where you should stay up and watch the game and enjoy it. You know, watch on stream with Dom, follow along on Twitter, Monty. And, and th this is I'm not going to be waiting for that. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry buddy. I, I have I have a kid, so that's that's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, right, like right. 5,000 of them in my Twitch chat. So <laughs> I feel you. See, yeah, we both have to take care of our kids. Dom has to take care of his stream kids on stream. I have to take care of my real life kid in real life so I, yeah. can't, I can't be up from midnight to 5 a.m watching that series yeah i mean it's fine your, your kid probably has more complex views on league of legends so <laughs> <laughs> probably so we got that we got playoffs kicking off here for uh the lcs uh as well they'll play one game per weekend i guess so it's just the uh the first two series on uh saturday and sunday and then LEC will have their playoffs as well. So just, again, lots of league, but now a little bit more spread out, not a bunch of Super Week, and more time to uh, get the VOD review in. Uh, closing thoughts, guys, before we... Uh, I, I have close a closing thought. Dom, I told you Aframu is going to play Bard on this show, and you said he's not going to play it. It's garbage in this meta. And I said, it doesn't matter. He's still going to play it because the Aframu pattern always is exactly the same, okay? He always is going to have at least one random Bard game Meta or not, he did it. He lost. Yeah, he did it and completely <laughs> ran it down. It looked fucking horrible. I honestly didn't think he had the balls. You know, so I, I stand corrected on that. I thought he actually wanted to win LCS games. So my bad. My bad. I take the, the, the Afro pattern. It will it will always hold. There will always be the bard game. I'll I'll do my best to go track down what happened in champs like there, either with sharks or with Afro. Uh also waiting for the Blitzcrank uh blitz game because he normally pulls out one of those a split as well that's true hasn't happened yet um quick got or dog dumb both uh okay so my i mean i think people can probably guess my uh my dog uh but my god for this week is going to be canyon even though he he lost i was impressed with him i i was impressed with him in the first series they played versus uh, Reddit Brian, and then I was impressed with uh, him. And you know what? He deserves to win something because Bernal is not going to let him win any series. So he'll win my goal. Well, Riot's not going to let him win, apparently. Yeah, Riot's not going to win, and Bernal's not going to let him win. So Bernal, <laughs> Bernal's responsible. Game two, game five is Riot. Game four is Chovy. We'll, we'll give Chovy game four. <laughs> uh, my, who do I want my god of the week to be? Um, I think play he I look, I think I think Malrong has to be a god for winning the way he did in some of these games. Uh the there were some very bold choices made by Malrong, and he <laughs> won in spite of them. So he overcame his own <laughs> yes. He overcame his own handicaps in order to successfully dominate a series. Um, it truly takes a God to be able to do that. So I think he is, he is well, do, do you think that he crossed the line 
on with some of these items based on the riot policy we discussed earlier? Uh, no. I think that's that's like right where they think is it's acceptable. Now, when he starts pulling out like the look, the Zanias, I'll take it. When he starts pulling out like the airy like Morello's first J four, that's a competitive ruling. So <laughs> he's right on the line. He's he's towing the line right now. Uh, but yep. it was fabulously entertaining to watch him play, even if it was confusing at times. He still dominated. He still won. Good on him. Uh, for me, give me Hilly. That shit was fun. Fun to watch Hilly dictate the game and wow. also throw the game. And also, yeah. your god or your dog or both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that was the name to the T. He was god in the games they won and dog in that one game. The, who, who else had very much their fingerprints all over a loss? I guess that would be the dogs. So go ahead, Dom, who you got? Okay, so for... My dog, I guess we'll go LCK again for this one. I'm going to go with, uh, with Birdall. Um, <laughs> like, even in the games where he was looking good, like, for example, in Akali game one of the, the uh, Reddit Brian series, I still was like, damn, bro, like, you're literally letting down my boy Canyon. He's ganking your lane just flat. Like, if he's communicating, like, that the guy is, is, that he's flashing, like, just follow him up, man. You have Ignite, you have E, you'll kill him. Um, and then, like, the Malphite game, I just, I, I couldn't handle the Malphite game. The Malphite game was, like, something else. The Malphite game was, it was special. So, Bertel is going to get my, uh, my, my dog. Especially, like, also because, you know, I feel like he's been questionable for a while. I mean, uh, when I think of him, the first thing I think of um, is the Aurelia game at Worlds. Into Ale's Fiora. I don't know if you guys remember that one. He was, like, 30 CS. <laughs> like, to, like, 110. Um top lane he just got absolutely shit on and yeah i mean the mouth okay. game no Nog will be back soon don't, that's don't what i'm hoping for it. that's what I'm, I'm or i'm just hoping for like hoya to like retain the spot he just he just doesn't look ready for that level of competition right now i mean hoya also had his own issues in that series pressing yeah. the lead that he was given a lot of the time or like randomly dying in a split push so i i wasn't super enthusiastic about hoya's performance either with I, the leads was, that he was given Sure. He was like a, a tier above, though, still for me. All right. Uh, anyway, I hope Nogari comes back. I hope this is he's he's done with his little break now. He he sees the glory of the top lane carry meta and he's like, I will be the one to compete with T1. That's what I hope happens. I hope he, he gains that. He gains the competitive spirit after having watched this game and seeing how close it was to a final, a final that he almost certainly could carry them to uh, had he been in the game instead. Uh, I'm I'm just going to, I mean, pick either Shlatan or Mursa. Probably Mursa, I think. It's hard to say who played worse. I feel kind of bad giving it to a, a player that I am highly confident had some stage nerves issues uh, because I'm sure a lot of people are already piling them, piling on. But it, it, this really just made it starkly clear that VTO and to a lesser degree Neon are the sole hopes of misfits. And if you're going to collapse at this level in a high pressure situation, misfits has a lot of sports psychology to do. If these players are going to be playoff caliber, uh, in the future, hopefully it was a one-off, but yeah, I'll, I'll go with Mercer. All right. There you have it. The gods, the dogs of the week. Let us know in the comments below who you guys had as the, uh, gods and dogs. Uh, definitely love going back and reading those, uh, this week, the special was, uh, what, was Peter Zhang from TSM actually spending his money on and why he needed $100,000. We had a lot of detectives out there coming up with a bunch of different reasons. So you can check that one out in the comments from our last video. Uh, all right, y'all. Uh, Dom, going to be streaming all the games as per usual. Monty, wh uh, where can people catch you uh, this upcoming week? Uh, well, we'll see you next week for the jungle. Otherwise, Summoning Insight will be out and around uh might actually be finally starting the new lck show with wolf so that might be exciting maybe it will happen maybe it won't stay tuned <laughs> okay <laughs> all right we'll, we'll, we'll wait with bated breath and of course you can catch uh, i i still conducted some interviews uh with the players hopefully catching some of the emotion of 
making playoffs, not making playoffs, tiebreakers, all that good stuff. Uh, so I'll have those up on Dion Esports over at my YouTube channel. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching. Long one again, and we got a lot more quality leagues starting to come on through now as playoffs and games are on the line. LCK champion will be crowned. And also LCS. Well, and also LCS. That's right. Thank you, Monty. I was I was almost there. Uh, <laughs> we can catch us covered all of it next week. Take care, everybody.